Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. And by the way, happy spring, if you can believe it. Uh, welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. My name is Larry Erickson. I'm your host. And for the next almost half hour, I'm going to be rattling on about things that I think are worthy of your attention. If you have any reactions to the show, email them to me directly. My personal email is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there if you'd rather. If you do email me, please include something in the subject line to make it clear this is not spam. And be a little patient by getting an answer because I'm terrible at answering email. But you will get an answer. All right, I think that's it. So uh, we're just going to get on with it. And we're going to start, as I always like to start when I can, with some good news. First up, the Obama administration has filed a brief express, expressing its view on the case that's currently before the Supreme Court about same-sex marriage. The brief urges the court to find such bans, and I'm quoting, incompatible with the Constitution, and says that state bans on same-sex marriage, again quoting, impose concrete harms on same-sex couples and send the inescapable message that same-sex couples and their children are second-class families unworthy of the recognition and benefits that opposite-sex couples take for granted. Now, it is good, good news that the White House has done that, and hopefully it will have some good impact on, um, on what the Supreme Court is going to uh, find. But even though I focused on same-sex marriage a lot, it's important to realize that there's more to this, more to this whole issue than marriage. In line with that, so next, I have to say that um, though this particular thing in the whole wide world of affairs is, you know, not terribly important, but... It does have meaning, and in some ways, it's an indication of progress that, um, in a lot of ways, is more important than how Barack Obama has evolved on the question of marriage. And that is the fact that, for the first time in its 114-year history, the Boston St. Patrick's Day Parade included gay and lesbian groups. OutVets, a service group for gay and lesbian military veterans, and the rights group Boston Pride were among the roughly 100 groups that took part in the annual parade through Southie. It's a dramatic turnaround by the organizers of the event, a group called the South Boston Allied War Veterans Council. Back in 1995, they went all the way to the Supreme Court to successfully defend their right as a supposedly private event to include and exclude whoever they chose. And the exclusions basically were gay and lesbian groups. But 20 years is more than a lifetime on this particular issue, and this year the council voted 5-4 to four to allow outfits in Boston Pride to take part. Uh, in fact, the council's commander, his name is Brian Mahoney, said, Who am I to judge when he was asked about sexual orientation? Meanwhile, the state of Utah, of all places, the state ranked the second most uh, um, Republican and the fourth most conservative in the entire country has passed a compromise bill that bars discrimination against lesbians, gays, bisexuals, and transgender individuals, that is LGBT people, uh, bars discrimination against them in housing and employment, while it also carves out uh, accommodations for individuals and institutions with what they claim are conscience-driven objections. Now, this bill has shortcomings. Uh, For one practical thing, while it does ban discrimination in housing and and employment, it does not address public accommodations, which means like stores, uh, hotels, motels, uh, entertainment venues, restaurants, and so on and so on. Uh, For another, carve-outs and civil rights protections are always objectionable because they give what certain people, what, what amounts, they give these certain people what amounts to a license to discriminate. Uh, And that kind of thing is never justified. It's not been done for civil rights laws. There's no reason it should be done here. What's more, extending the carve out to individuals, as was done here, as opposed to institutions and organizations, that could prove to be a huge loophole, which might render the entire thing meaningless. So why, despite all that, is is this a sign of progress? First off, because it was Utah. 
Second off, because this bill was passed with the full support of the Mormon Church, which was actually the organization that reached out to LGBT groups in Utah to, for discussions that led to the compromise legislation. Equality Utah Executive Director uh, Troy Williams said the bill was something that none of us thought was possible. And just a few years ago, it wouldn't have been. Nor would the White House have been calling for an end to bans on same-sex marriage, nor would OutVets and Boston Pride be marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. So yes, all of that is signs of progress and good news. But don't be fooled. This doesn't mean the struggle is over. Even if the Supreme Court rules, as we hope it will, and as a lot of court watchers expect it will, on the issues of same-sex marriage, uh, marriage, again, is not the only issue, as the Utah bill makes clear. Bigotry is still the default position in too many minds in too many places. For example, according to Oklahoma State Senator Joseph Silk, LGBT folks don't have a right to be served in public places if the proprietors say that they have religious beliefs against it. Uh, he has introduced a bill that would shield businesses from lawsuits based on discrimination against certain customers on the basis of being uh, gay or lesbian. He openly acknowledged that LGBT people were the targets of the bill, claiming that their desire to have their civil rights protected is, quoting him, the primary thing that's going to be challenging religious liberties and freedom. He followed that up with a statement on his campaign website that said LGBT people are, quoting again, a threat to our freedoms and liberties because they're campaigning for their civil rights. Now, according to Silk's bill, Businesses, including nonprofits, would have the right to deny services, accommodations, advantages, facilities, and goods or privileges to anyone who offends their tender religious sensibilities. They could also refuse to provide counseling, adoption, foster care, and any other social services, while also they could refuse to hire a person based on uh, their, their, their gender or sexual orientation. Now, this is a bill. That doesn't mean it will necessarily pass. But Oklahoma is not the only state considering such a law. Arkansas, Georgia, Colorado, Hawaii, Indiana, Michigan, West Virginia, South Dakota, and Wyoming have all recently considered or are considering these sort of God gave me the right to be a bigot laws. Uh, now, all, not all of these bills will be successful, but it does point up the need for continued efforts in this area of human rights. The thing is, even when local governments try to do the right thing, they can be hindered by state governments. For example, Arkansas and Tennessee have both passed laws barring local governments from, uh, uh, from protecting LGBT people against discrimination. The Arkansas law is new. Tennessee one was passed back in 2011. Now, even though it's clear what these bills are about, for example, the Arkansas bill came up because the city of Fayetteville, Arkansas, passed legislation barring discrimination there. Uh, even though that's clearly what these bills are about, lawmakers in both those states, Arkansas and Tennessee, claim that their bills will be immune to constitutional challenge because they don't specifically single out LGBT people. Despite that, there may be a challenge coming soon. The word is that officials in Little Rock, Arkansas, are considering uh, legislation to um, protect civil rights of gay and lesbian people, which would form the basis of a lawsuit to challenge the state law. But here's the thing. Here's the thing to remember. Look at this map, okay? The states in dark green on this map have civil rights protections for LGBT people. Those in light green have at least some protections for gays and lesbians, but not for transgender people. In all those other states, in all that field of white, there are no legal protections at all. In those states, under state law, you can be fired for being gay. You can be denied service at a restaurant if you're lesbian. You can be kicked out of a store if you're transgender. You can be denied housing, denied services, denied employment, and it's all entirely legal. Now, there are some protections under federal law, but as far as the state law goes in all of those states, you get bupkis. 
Yes, we are winning the war on same-sex marriage. And yes, there is progress. Just consider the Mormon church and just consider South Boston. That doesn't mean there's not still more to do. All right, moving on from there to one of our regular features, it is the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. This week it's quite appropriate because the award has been given to somebody, the big red nose is going to somebody who not only walks the walk and talks the talk, he sort of looks the part. The big red nose this week goes to South Carolina Senator and militarist nutcase Lindsey Graham. At a forum hosted by the Republican Committee of Concord, New Hampshire last weekend, Graham Cracker was asked about the automatic so-called cuts in military spending under sequestration. Uh, this is based on a requirement of an earlier budget agreement. And you, you need to understand first that these cuts are not actually cuts. They're smaller increases. But in any event, when asked about this, this is what Graham Cracker said, and I'm quoting. I worried about this from day one. I'm sick to my stomach. And here is the first thing I would do if I was President of the United States. I wouldn't let Congress leave town until we fix this. I would literally use the military to keep them in if I had to. We're not leaving a town until we restore these defense cuts. We're not leaving town until we restore the intel cuts. Killing terrorists is the only option other than capturing them because they're not deterred by death. No one at the time seems to have asked our weekly clown if he realized that what he had just proposed was, in effect, a military coup. A military overthrow of the government, that he as commander-in-chief of the military would use the military to force Congress to vote the way he wanted them to. Maybe it's because those people are too busy trying to figure out how terrorists are not deterred by death, since death usually puts pretty much a big crimp in anybody's plans. But after word of this got out, Graham Cracker's staff reached for the first and most obvious defense. He was joking. Come on. It's a hyperbole. You know, it wasn't serious. Lighten up. After which, the usual crowd of bootlicking journalists, so-called journalists, who build their lives around convincing themselves that people like Graham Cracker really are responsible national leaders, they jumped on board with audible sighs of relief. Oh, well, glad that's settled. You know, get a sense of humor, would you? Except, based on a recording of the statement, the folks there didn't seem to think it was a joke. Even David Weigel, who used to be a, a journalist until he realized that, uh, that kissing the butt of every politician in D.C. was better for his career, uh, and who happily, by the way, lapped up the just joking meme, uh, he admits the joke got, quoting him, some rueful chuckles and not much else. Now, considering Graham Cracker was before much the same sort of crowd, in front of which back in 2008, his BFF, Senator John McCaint, uh, offered to very appreciative, widespread laughter his side splitter about bomb, 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 Iran, taking Graham Cracker at his word probably wasn't hard for them to do, or frankly, hard for me. This is a guy, remember, whose only criticism of, of the amazing Mr. O's lovely little war is that it's little, it's not big, it's not big and bloody and spread across two and perhaps three nations. This is a guy who has never seen a tank he didn't want to see crashing into houses, has never seen a bomb he didn't want to drop, has never seen blood he wasn't willing to see shed. He is a militarist who sees war and more war as the solution to every international problem. So do I find it at all difficult to believe that such a man could have seriously been entertaining the idea of using the military to make Congress do his bidding? No, I don't. But even if I'm wrong, even if he was merely being, you know, hyperbolic, the very fact that his repeated statements, his repeated stands, uh, have made it entirely reasonable to believe that he could have been serious, that fact alone marks him as somebody unworthy of holding public office and as a complete and unremitting clown. And we are taking a break. And we're back. Now, I, I've, actually, I've talked several times about the issue of net neutrality, the idea that all data on the Internet should be treated equally, and including, I also noted my pleasure when the FCC uh, last month voted for a strong version of net neutrality. But um, 
Amid all the discussions about that, there was something else the FCC did that got missed. Something that has a lot of potential to do a lot of good, and I wanted to mention it here. On the same day that it voted in favor of net neutrality, the FCC also voted to overturn laws in Tennessee and North Carolina that restricted the ability of local governments to provide internet access to their residents. Chattanooga, Tennessee and Wilson, North Carolina both already offer local uh, uh, internet access, but state laws there had prevented them from a plan to expand, reach them to expand those services to reach more residents. They filed petitions asking the FCC to overturn the state government bans, which the FCC granted. Now, the thing is, the telecoms, of course, they hate public access to broadband because it interferes with their monopoly powers and their profits. Uh, and they have been lobbying state legislatures around the country to, uh, for these bans to prevent local cities and towns from establishing their own public internet access. They've been arguing simultaneously that it's not fair for them to have to compete against a government, a uh, government internet provider, and that such projects are usually expensive failures. Now, why it would be hard for them to compete against an expensive failure is kind of hard to understand, except perhaps that considering the fact that cable companies consistently rank at the bottom of the list in terms of customer satisfaction, maybe it's not as hard after all. But the thing is, because these votes are on the petitions presented, the FCC's action only affects those two states. And the restrictions in any other states which have them, they still stand. But it does give a strong indication of how the FCC would respond to similar petitions from other cities and towns. Now, and the thing is, this decision should not be considered in isolation. This should be considered as part and parcel of the huge movement, the millions of ordinary people who contacted the FCC in favor of net neutrality and open access, with the result of which is that we may not only get net neutrality, but some of us may get meaningful internet competition, or maybe if we lobby our local governments hard enough, maybe even free local wireless. All right, next up, uh, it's time for our other regular weekly feature. It's the Outrage of the Week. Now, I actually wanted to do this last week when it was fresh news, but time didn't permit. But it was too important to let slide, so I'm going to do it now. The state of Florida is the region most susceptible in the country to the effects of global warming uh, over the next decades. Sea level rise alone threatens 30% of the state's beaches over the next 85 years. Last year, the National Climate Assessment said that Miami is one of the cities in the United States most vulnerable to damage from rising sea levels. A uh, paper from the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Compact warned that water in the area, the Miami area, could rise as much as two feet by 2060. Now, such effects are, the, uh, of course, the effects of global warming or climate change, if you prefer. They both mean the same thing, so just pick whichever one you want. Despite that, despite that, according to work done by the Florida Center for Investigative Reporting, Florida government Rick Scott, better known as Voldemort, has banned state officials and organizations and researchers, uh, the researchers who are charged with dealing with the effects of global warming, he has banned the uses of the terms climate change, global warming, or sustainability in any official communications, emails, or reports. Even the term sea level rise was banned in favor of, get this, nuisance flooding. That last prohibition appears to have been lifted, either that or the fact is no one could say nuisance flooding with a straight face. Uh, one example of the effect of this that was cited by the Center for Investigative Reporting is the annual research plan of the Florida Oceans and Coastal Council. And this plan is put together by state agencies to deal with protecting the Florida coast. The 29-2010 report, published the year before Voldemort became governor, uh, contains 15 references to climate change and one section actually calls it a research priority. In the 2014-2015 report, the term climate change appears only if it was in the title of a previous report. 
Now, this ban, this is according to uh, uh, former employees of the State Department of Environmental Protection, according to consultants and volunteers who work with the agency. These are all people who spoke with the uh, Center for Investigative Reporting uh, Reporters. Uh, this ban was instituted shortly after Voldemort was elected and was transmitted verbally and passed that way down the hierarchy. So the result is that Voldemort's administration is saying there is no policy on this because there's nothing in writing about it. Meanwhile, Voldemort slinks along, ignoring the peril to his state while keeping Nagini close at his side. Asked in 2010 if he believes in climate change, he said no. Asked again last year, he slithered to what has become the default answer for right-wingers on the subject of climate change. He said, well, I'm not a scientist. Just once, I'd like to see the follow-up question of, then why aren't you listening to the people who are? University of Miami professor Harold Wanless said that at this point it is beyond ludicrous and even criminal to deny the term climate change. It is all that and it is an outrage. In fact, it's more than outrageous. Professor Wanless has it right. It's criminal. It is just downright criminal. It's criminal negligence. I mean, I haven't talked about climate change in a while now, uh, but that doesn't mean that the evidence for it does not just keep piling up. For one example, a paper that was published March March 9th in the peer-reviewed scientific journal Nature Climate Change concluded that global warming is poised to accelerate at rates unseen for at least a thousand years. What's more, the Arctic, North America, and Europe are going to be the first areas to experience this shift in climate. The thing is, over the past thousand years or so, temperatures have tended to vary up or down by about two-tenths of a degree Fahrenheit per decade, you know, 0.2 degrees per decade. Over the last 40 years, it has been a steady increase, ranking at about 0.4 degrees per decade, twice as fast, and in fact, just barely within the historical bounds. By 2020, that rate of increase should exceed those bounds, and if greenhouse gas emissions are not severely cut, the rate of warming will reach seven-tenths of a degree Fahrenheit per decade every 10 years and stay that high until at least 2100. We are talking here about and like something like four to five degrees Celsius warming above what we've already had. This is disaster territory. And the thing is, we don't have to wait to see the effects of climate change. In fact, we don't have to wait at all for that matter. There is evidence linking both the uh, evidence that climate change is linked both to the extreme storms and blizzards seen in the east and northeast this year and the extended drought in California, which has left the state with only about a year's worth of water. Um, And it promises to get worse. Winter storms have been increasing in frequency and intensity since the 1950s. While new research published in the journal of the uh, in the journal called Science Advances last month predicts that drought conditions unprecedented in a thousand years are likely to hit the southwest and central plains of the United States after 2050 with a more than 80 percent chance of a 35 year or longer mega drought. According to NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, sea level rise in the northeast rose four inches in one year, 29 to 2010, a level called unprecedented in the history of the tide gauge record, and it is said to represent a one in 850 year event. Greenland may now be warmer than at any point in the past 100,000 years, and it may have passed the point of no return where natural processes are going to accelerate the rate of ice loss, a rate that is already now six times what it was in 2001. Meanwhile, two uh, two peer-reviewed studies from January predict that extreme versions of El Nino and La Nina will likely occur nearly twice as often as a result of global warming if greenhouse gases continue to increase the way they have been. That means that people living around the Pacific Ocean Basin, including parts of Asia, Australia, and western parts of North and South America, should expect wild climate swings in the future, uh, including torrential rains alternating with searing droughts, with the prospect of tens of thousands thousands more weather-related deaths. A study published last month in the journal Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B, two zoologists uh, studying parasites in dramatically different environments, one in the Arctic, the other in the tropics, both came to the same discovery. 
As climate change causes habitats of species to shift or vanish, parasites unexpectedly were able to jump to a new species, a species which had no natural resistance to the parasite because it hadn't dealt with it before. At the same time, climate change also opens up new areas into which pathogens can spread. The result of all this is that the rate of and damage done by outbreaks of diseases such as bird flu, cholera, uh, Ebola, plague, tuberculosis, and others can be expected to increase. And to cap it all off, you know that so-called pause in global warming, the pause that really wasn't a pause, it was just a slower rate of increase? Um, well, there's a reason for this so-called pause. Research reported at the end of February in the peer-reviewed journal Science found that the slowdown was caused by an interaction in two naturally occurring uh, ocean oscillations uh, affecting ocean winds, currents, and conditions. One of which affects the Atlantic Ocean, the other uh, affects the Pacific. Without getting into technical details, the result of this interaction is that excess heat was being piled up in the tropical Pacific Ocean and the, in the Western Pacific, which means that this is why ocean temperatures have been rising faster than was predicted and land temperatures, the ones we usually hear about, have been rising slower. This creates the false pause in global warming. What this means in sum is that the result of these natural oscillations has been to suppress the evidence of human-driven warming. As that Pacific oscillation moves out of one phase into another phase, which it appears to be doing now, uh, the result is Pacific trade winds will slacken, the heat will not get piled up in one area, it'll get spread out, with the result that heat will be into the air, and we are liable to see over the next few years a dramatic spike in global temperatures. Some have suggested that might convince some of the nanny nanny naysayers about climate change, but personally, I've come to doubt it. Uh, perhaps the bigger question is, will we be ready when the spike comes? And I kind of doubt that too. So, one last thing. I got about one minute, I expect. It appears that Benjamin Netanyahu is uh, prepared to again become Prime Minister of Israel. It's not certain yet. You've got to remember this is a parliamentary system. He has to put together a coalition that will give him a majority in the Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament. And his old coalition, which had 61 seats, a bare majority of the 120-seat Knesset, um, actually lost four seats in this election, even as, even as uh, Netanyahu's own party did very well and gained a lot of seats. The result is he still needs to get approval of one of the centrist parties in the Knesset to join his coalition. If they do, he's got a government. If they don't, he doesn't. Um, he'll probably get it. But uh, it still means that it's still a big, as I'm doing this now, it is still a big if. The thing is, Benjamin Netanyahu is an imperialist, he is a liar, he is a hypocrite, and he is a racist. And I am prepared to, and I will, defend every one of those claims next week. But for now, I'm out of time, so I bid you have the best week you possibly can. Peace.